Welcome to the podcast, episode 67. Good to have you with us. Thanks for coming. Thanks for paying attention. So, uh, as this is being recorded, that one of the things in the news, one of the one of the little happy spots in the news, is the fact that uh, Elizabeth Warren had a DNA test uh, done, and and it turns out that a number of generations ago, she might have had a Native American ancestor, maybe. And this gives us uh, something like I think it's one. 1,024th part Cherokee or Indian or whatever. So what this, uh, th- there, are several, there are multiple layers to this, th- and all of them make this a, uh, a happy little talking point. The, the first is that it would be hard in, in, in these are days of identity politics, in, in this time of where you have multiple groups who have indulged the fellowship of the grievance, and they have given themselves over to identity politics and intersectionality and, um, you know, lesbian, lesbian, Native American, African American, uh, transgender, you know, one oppressed class after another. In this vortex, in this vortex, in this pandemonium of identity politics, one of the front runners one of the front runners on the uh, Democratic side is Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and Elizabeth Warren is about as white as white can get. I mean, she, there's no her. She's white. She is whiter than white. She, her ideas are white. Her political philosophy is white. And yet that white philosophy has to disparage, downplay background being white. So you've got the white, one of the whitest candidates you've ever had in a long time, um, you know, white and blonde, and t- taught at Harvard, and you know all of this, and and yet she got her job, she got her gig at Harvard by claiming to be. Um, Native American by claiming uh, that identity. And she was listed as a uh, Native American uh, uh, faculty member. And she, back in the day, contributed to a cookbook. And the name of the cookbook was Pow Wow Chow. So Pow Wow Chow. And that that should be a, a career-ending thing for a politician right there. I mean, <laughs> anybody, who, anybody who contributed a family recipe uh, of um, Native American cookery, and and that cookbook is called Pow Wow Chow, and the recipe that you contributed was lifted from the New York Times. It wasn't a family recipe at all. That, I mean, that should be all over. It should be all over for you. But it's not all over for Elizabeth Warren. But that, that, leaves us, that leads us to the second thing. Uh, a bunch of people are covering for her and saying, see, this um, distant ancestor uh, shows that she did have Native American ancestry. Yes, but below the national average for all white people. And so what's the, what's the next level? What's the next layer uh, of problem? Well, she did this now. She took the DNA test because uh, President Trump has been making... Uh, endless fun of her calling her Pocahontas, going back to her getting this teaching job by claiming to be Native American and being called on it, being busted on it. And the president has been mocking her over and over again by calling her Pocahontas. And then the other name is Focahontas. Um, And so he keeps doing that. And so she wants to run. She wants to be the, she wants to uh, get into the race for the next presidential and so she thought, I'll take this DNA test and I will put this whole thing behind me. I'll have something something that I can brazen out. I'll have some sort of, um, there may be a little tempest in a teapot for a while, but then I'll just ride it out and then it'll be all over. But the explosion of laughter at, at the results the, and the, the derision that this has been subject, subjected to indicates that... Um, She's not going to be able to lean into it. She's not going to be able to embrace any kind of Indian heritage. And she is 
not going to be able to go, go on being herself because, I mean, that's that's just Wonder Bread right there. All right, so I think this is a, it's still very early. There are all sorts of things that can happen, and I'm not writing Elizabeth Warren out. I'm just saying that America likes to elect very, very white people, and so she still has a chance. So uh, we come to our book review section, and I am, I'd like to review a book I'm currently in the midst of, currently reading. Haven't completed it yet. I might have more to say after I've completed it, but I'm kind of whizzed up about it now, um, just the portion that I've read thus far. Um, the book is by George Gilder, and it's called Life After Google. George Gilder, Life After Google. Now, I'm I'm a big fan of Gilder's. I've, I've read him um, read his books um, for years and years. The first big one was Wealth and Poverty back in the 80s during the uh, during the Reagan era. Um, Wealth and Poverty, he also has uh, uh, he, he's just he's just a good uh, writer. I've, I've re- reviewed another one of his books uh, for this podcast uh, called Men in Marriage, which was originally sexual suicide, and then was revised and and released as Men in Marriage. George Gilder is simply a provocative, foundational thinker. He gets down to the bedrock. He gets down to the bare, uh, uh, just the, the fundamental issues laid bare. Now, life after Google, what what's the basic setup here? So in, in Gilder's world, and the, the world that he is sketching, um, the big tech companies like like Google and like Twitter and so on, Facebook, are not the, the uh, harbingers of the new digital era. They are not the future. Google, uh, when, when Gilder looks at Google... He is not looking at the future, but rather he's looking at the last of the dinosaurs. So uh, think of it this way. Uh, Think of it this way. Um, The logic of the Industrial Revolution was to centralize everything. The logic was centralization. And and so you, you built your manufacturing plants in Manchester, England, for example, in the Industrial Revolution, and people flocked to the city to get a job, and they lived around the factory and then went into the factory and worked there. And so you had massive urbanization, massive industrialization because of that centralizing impulse. Well, Google is a centralizing company, and there's an optical illusion here because to the user, it appears, it appears to be a decentralizing thing. So uh, it appears that way because you can have your mobile device and you can have your, 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 your phone, you can have your iPad, you can have your laptop, you can go anywhere, you can hop onto somebody else's computer and get into your, your Gmail account from anywhere. You are, you are sort of um, cut loose and you think, oh, I'm, Look at me! I'm free. I'm this is I'm radically decentralized. Well, that's like having all the cars in North America manufactured in Detroit, and you thinking that this is decentralizing because you can drive your car anywhere. Well, yeah, but all the cars are manufactured in Detroit. Um, where are Google's servers? Where is this cloud that everybody talks about? You, you need to remember that the cloud is simply a an, an inaccurate way of referring to somebody else's computer. Where's your information? It's in the cloud. That means it's on somebody else's server and somebody else's um, uh, data bank. It's somewhere else. It's not not under your control. And uh, and so Google, uh, they've got their, this huge uh, operation uh, out in the Dalles um, in Oregon. And all of this information is centralized uh, accumulated. It's just this huge slag heap of data. So when you have that kind of centralization, what do you have? Well, you have vulnerability. Vulnerability is where um, hackers can get in. And why? Lo, look, look, 
50, 50 million profiles, 50 million personal accounts with personal information, all in one place. Now, what, what Gilder is arguing is that, uh, that there is uh, something, there's a sleight of hand being performed here, and people are starting to catch on. And Gilder is saying when they fully catch on, it's going to be not all over. It's not like he thinks that Google is going to disappear off the face of the earth, but it's not going to be the giant that it, uh, that it is now. Um, he quotes uh, Tim Cook of Apple, who's, um, who said something very apropos in this regard, and that, that is, if all the stuff you're getting from your company is free, like Gmail is free and the browser, the, the uh, uh, Google Images is free. All of these things are free. If it's free, then Tim Cook said, you're the product. So the reason you're getting all these products for free is not because Google is giving away free stuff. They are giving you free stuff, but they are selling your information to advertisers. Your, you and your information are the product. So you are being bought and sold. Now, in response to this, Gilder says that that the future is uh, the fu- the future of the internet is going to be a security first future. Security is security in the first instance, and security that is controlled by you, not by the company. And again, there's an optical illusion that you control uh, your security. Because you have you have to come up with your own password and stuff. Yeah, that that means that you can control your security. You can control certain um, uh, files or programs from your roommate. You can you can secure your information from someone who lives with you and who might come look at the computer. But the fact that you have passwords that Google uh, knows and can change, and the fact that you have, <laughs> I mean, Google can share they can have that information of all of yours stolen from them or they could hand it over to the government or they could and, and they don't need to come to you to find out to get your password to do it uh, what Gilder is arguing is that he he is saying the uh, blockchain uh, economy is the future and and this is of course uh, known to people through um, uh, cryptocurrency Bitcoin and that sort of thing but if you, ha- if you have a security-first approach, uh, crypto code can be written in such a way as to put the user, the individual user, in control of his security. And it, it's not going to be up to Facebook. It couldn't be stolen from Facebook. It can't be taken from Google. It can't be taken from Twitter and so on because they don't have it. Um, so... Um, Life after Google, uh, he anticipates a major decline in the power and influence of the big tech companies. They're not going to conquer the world. They're not going to live forever. They're not going to rule all things. Uh, I commend it to you. Gilder is always good. Life after Google. So we've come in episode 67 of the podcast to our hamartiology section, and we're going to consider today the verb amelio. All right, the verb amelio, and that means to neglect, and it's used in various ways in the New Testament. Those foolish individuals who were invited to the wedding of the prince in Christ's parable made light of it. That's in Matthew 22, 5. Timothy is commanded by Paul not to neglect the gift that was in him. That's in 1 Timothy 4, 14. If we neglect the great salvation that has been established, how shall we escape? That's Hebrews 2, 3. Peter resolves that he will not be negligent, he will not neglect, to remind his readers of their responsibility to press on in the grace of God. And as a result of Israel's neglect of the covenant with God, God determined to regard them not. Hebrews 8, 9. So, in other words, their neglect led to God's neglect. Because they neglected him, he neglected them. And with, with all these uses of the verb amelio, uh, we have a good example of a sin of omission. 
not all sins are to be identified with doing wrong. A neglect of doing right is also a clear problem. So, uh, the com- for example, the command to keep the Sabbath is a command to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, too often we have uh, we see that kids learn the bad habit of trying to excuse sin or excuse disobedience or excuse the failure to complete a task with the excuse, I forgot. But mom, I forgot. But in the Bible, in the in the in the way the Bible works, forgetting is not an excuse for sin. Forgetting is an additional sin. So uh, you're you're compounding the problem. So neglecting to do these things um, is a sin, and it's a sin of omission. God in the time of the sickness. God in the doctor too.